Mary Hill Boy, for me, that started <laughs> off watching Thistle in the early 1960s to have met this gentleman on a few occasions before, but to, to try and host this. And really, I think there's probably only one thing missing this afternoon, and somebody seems to have conveniently... He <laughs> knows the way to my heart. <laughs> we'll move the vodka out the road and we'll stick with it. <laughs> yeah. So if I can just, just start with, uh, with reminiscing on Stuart. What kind is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful place, Little. The budget's not high. <laughs> <laughs> as we said, this session really is in honour of, of Stuart as a, a pioneer, as Frank said, not just in cardiology, but from our point of view of, of sport and exercise medicine. And just to kick us off, what, what's your memories of Stuart? Well, I first got to know Stuart when he was a doctor at Clyde Bank, and I was at St Mirren, and that was a big tussle for the championship, the first division. And we played him on Christmas Day, believe it or not, it was, I think it was the only game ever on Christmas Day. It was the only game in Britain that day. Anyway, we're down 2 now at half time, and we're out playing him. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we go back to 2 1, and we had this uh, situation, and we played a 1 2 in our half. Billy Stark go through and the linesman flagged offside. And I ran down, I don't know what possessed me, but I ran down after the linesman. And this white raincoat at the time, they were quite fashionable. <laughs> and Stuart and Billy Monroe, the manager, yeah. grabbed me with the, the tails of my coat, pulled me back, preventing me from ending the, my life in jail. Yeah. <laughs> but that was the first time I ever got to know Stuart. But the real great memory was... Uh, when I became manager of Scotland after Jockstein died. And of course, I'd been with Stuart in the build-up to the World Cup of 1986 when I joined Jock in 1984. Um, but when I got the opportunity to manage, and I couldn't refuse it really, although I was still manager of Aberdeen, I made sure I was going to be as prepared as I possibly could. So I had a meeting at Dumbleyne Hydro in January with all the medical staff of Stuart, the physios, and I picked my team, my, my, my coaches, Ed Walter Smith and my assistant, Archie Knox, Craig Brown, and Andy Roxburgh. And I wanted to make sure, and we went down to the thing about dehydration. And, and it was, it sure brought the point, like, you know, we need to make sure we don't get caught in this because Montezuma is revenge in Mexico, the food they're eating, all that type of thing. And when we got to the States, Stuart organised all the fluids to get into, from the States into uh, to Mexico. And that was a big advantage because not one player got any diarrhoea. Only one person that was one of the staff. I'm not, I'm not accountable for him. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a great contribution because I went down to see Alf Ramsey <clears throat> when he'd managed England in 1970 yeah. in Mexico. And they'd, well, if, I don't know if you remember, but they lost Peter Benetti. No, sorry, they lost Gordon, Gordon Banks, Banks yeah. in the, the most important game against Germany yep. in the decider for the group. And Pierre Bernetti played. Gordon Banks had got the diarrhoea. And that cost them possibly a chance of winning the World Cup because yep. they, they were the holders. And he was great. He, was, he says, you've got to take your own water. You've got to. We took vats on the plane with our water. And I said, oh, God, that doesn't sound the right thing to me. So Stuart solved the problem by getting it. Uh, shipped in from the States. And I think in those days, I mean, we're talking, you know, the best part of 30 years ago now, you would kind of say that was the beginning of sports science before sports science really became a thing that it is now. So he was thinking about the players' welfare. You mentioned nutrition, you mentioned fluids at that time. You must have seen a progression in your time in football oh, yeah. with that I, side I of think, the game. I think the, the, the signs were there. It was coming along. Um, and, of course, I mean, if you, if you think about that... In 74, when I started as a manager, I had my own ideas about nutrition. Because when I played, all I ate on a Friday and a Saturday was women's soul, mm -hmm. grilled women's soul, and toast and honey. That's all I ate. So when I became a manager, he's still in. And uh, we didn't have lunch before the games, but we were playing Falkirk. It was a local derby, and I'd played for Falkirk, and I was wanting to be them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we had a board meeting. <laughs> we had a board meeting on Thursday, and... Once you cut through the smoke at the East Island board and you get to the table where they're sitting there. And I says, I'd like to take the team for lunch on Saturday. Honestly, you thought I was going to kill them. 
Lunch? What are you talking about? And it was only £27, pound, by the way. <laughs> I said, I'll pay for it myself. But anyway, one of the directors says, I'll pay for it. So I went up to the local hotel, sorted out where there'll be 15 of us, including myself and the physio, two subs, 11 players, two slices of lemon soul, toast and honey and tea. And the guy says, they'll never eat that. No, no, you're no chance. I says, that's what I'm getting. <laughs> so, so the players, honestly, have you seen the players' faces? Honestly, it was priceless. They're muttering and fucking miserable. <laughs> All sorts of things. I says, it went to no. It went to no. And that, to me, you know, was... And then when I went to Aberdeen, Aberdeen used to go to this boarding house and used to get fillet steaks for their lunch. Yeah. Do you believe that? Yep. That was finished. <laughs> Lemon soul and toast and honey. So I had, more, I had more ideas about food. Then if you think back after Stuart's time about, about the World Cup, marathon runners were starting to take pasta and porridge and things like that. Mm. So there was change in all that in terms of your diet before marathon running and and physical exercise, and particularly in football matches, where the speed of the game get bigger, get greater. And then sports science come in, you know, the, all these things, the GPS. I mean, the, the improvements in the game in my time were enormous, you know. It must be the first time ever in Falkirk they've served fish without any chips. <laughs> <laughs> and not battered. <laughs> You'd mentioned there about sports science and about medical changes. Uh, you've been in the, in the game a long time and you must have seen quite a lot of changes. Uh, Alex Smith, who's a, a pal of both of ours, when he was a manager at Clyde, would say to me, what's wrong with him? He's got a medial ligament injury. How long is he going to be out for? And you'd say, whatever, four, six, six weeks, whatever. And he'd say, 20 years ago, before you had all your fancy machines and all your physios and all your ultrasounds, how long were they out for? And you'd say, four to six weeks. There you are. That proves it. It's a load of rubbish. <laughs> Perhaps paraphrasing Alex a, a, a wee bit too, too cruelly, but from the medical side, again, massive change within your, your period of time. Going back to East Stirling, oh, when yeah. no doctor and a, and a physio who, with respect, might not have been a, a qualified physio, he might have been a, a sponge man or a trainer oh, yeah. at that time, as they were called. Yeah, there was no guy at Falk, Andy Godfrey, uh, no qualifications, but he could find your muscle injury right in there, going, oh, here it is, <laughs> finding gold. He, he thrived in finding the, where the, oh, you, ah. And there was a guy, there was a physio at Aberdeen that tell me that he used to have the heat lamp on the players' muscle injuries and he'd be smoking and actually be going on their legs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, you've got to think about what it was like in these days. And, um, but uh, the, the, the improvements are incredible. Aberdeen, United nowadays, the medical centre at United is fantastic. Yeah. We've got three scanners, you know, yeah. ultrasound and... Um, which have an MRI on MRI. site now. And the only thing they can, can't do is operations at United. Yeah. I mean, and that was my biggest signing, maybe. Or maybe that was my best signing. Because if you think about it, I'd Ryan Giggs for 25 years, Ronaldo for, say, six years. But they leave, they, they, they get older, or they, they sold Ronaldo. But the medical centre will be there for 100 years. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I've fought so hard to get that medical centre, really. David Gill, I pestered away for him. I really did. Pestered away for him until we got it. And it took, it took maybe six, six, maybe five, six years to get the, 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 the message across to him. Which was, what I said to you was, was about United. We don't want a player to leave. And the best way of keeping them is to have the best training centre in the world. And if it's a medical thing, then we should do it. So that when they've, they've got, and if they're thinking about leaving, they think, well, well, wait a minute, everything's here. Yeah. You know, and it's a fantastic training centre. I tell you, David Gill's done well to resist you for six years for getting that ultrasound. Well, with some Toshiba. arguments. With some arguments. Yeah. He's, he's, he's a great man. He's a fantastic man. Going back to, to Scotland and back to, to Aberdeen days and then uh, fantastic success within football there. <clears throat> And there's a couple of your, your colleagues, I saw Mr Wiley earlier on floating around oh, in, the, right. in the audience. Uh, can't keep a bad man down. So d take us back a wee bit to that time. It's coming up to the time of the year, as the, I think was it the anniversary of the Cup Winners' Cup this week? It's, it's this time in May, is it not? Round about from, yeah, yeah. Yeah, from uh, May, May, Real Madrid. May the 12th. 
Mm. Give, us, give us a wee insight into your, your planning for that game and, and what went through your mind against the team that you were playing and, and pitting a, a, a relatively small unknown team from Scotland, although obviously people knew yeah. about you with the success and quality and getting there. Well, we, um, I went to see them play in the semi-final, second leg, Madrid, Real, because we played on a Tuesday night against Watershy. I would win the first leg 5-1, and that is a great friend in Sweden. He was a security, uh, the chief of security in Volvo Trucks in Gothenburg, and he sorted out the best hotel. It's called Farsa in an Aberdeen, I mean, where's that? Okay? <laughs> and <laughs> just by coincidence, that's what it was called. Just outside Gothenburg, fantastic. Training ground was brilliant. And he sorted, once we won 5 1, he booked it, right? Yeah. We're going to was yeah. one five win the same way, but anyway, we played a Tuesday night, so I was able to fly from from Belgium to Madrid on on Wednesday to see them play. So after the game, they won two one. They beat Rapid Vienna two one, and, and I phoned Dick Don, the chairman, and Dick was typical Scot. I mean, an Aberdonian, really. He coveted, you know, at the KGB, you know, <laughs> and uh, I says. I says, well, I think we're a certainty. He says, for God's sake, don't tell anybody that. <laughs> don't breathe a word of that. He was, he was, and then I spoke to Archie and Oxford. I says, Archie, we're going to be, we'll be Madrid. We were a better team than them. Yeah. And they had some great players. But what Aberdeen had, they had this incredible spirit, built by players growing up together. You know, that, and I took that everywhere I went. The foundation of the club is the most important thing. Not, the, not the, the team, the football team, the football club, so that you're building something that'll last forever. And Aberdeen, as year went on and to, to a level, they were going to Ibrox and Celtic Park, absolute favourites, you know? Yeah. And that's because it was built up within the club, all young players coming through. In fact, the, the team that won in Madrid was only two bot players, Weir, no, three, Strachan, Weir and McGee. You know, the rest were home produced. And what's ever happened to Strachan and McGee? What are they up to now? They've done all right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that's a particularly Scottish thing? You mentioned about that team spirit and about it being really important in you to in, in, in get that in. We talk about in sports medicine now, probably more than ever, multidisciplinary teams. And you look at yeah. things like the Commonwealth Games and our team and the organising yeah. committee and Team Scotland. Is that a particularly Scottish thing or are we just, do we put more faith in it? Are we better at it? No, I don't think it's a Scottish thing. It's the, 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 the personality of the leader. I think it's what he believes in your, his philosophy. I think he can create it anywhere. Where I, Manchester United, you know, when I went to Manchester United, I was making sure I stood by my philosophy, what I believed in, and that was building from youth and making sure there was a strong youth. Uh, and then it paid fantastic dividends because if you look at that 92 team, not only did they become great players, they became great human beings, fantastic people. And they, they grew up together and they're great friends together. And I think that value, when people talk about what was the best player at Manchester United, they'll go Cantona, they'll go Keane, Robson, all these players. But they created the spirit of Manchester United without question in my time. Mm. I think that Matt Busby probably had the same experience with the build, the, how he built the Busby Babes. So that fantastic experience and also that pleasure of, for the youth coaches, the reserve coaches, seeing these young players coming through on their, on their uh, uh, supervision, their coaching to bring them to a level that I needed in the first team and that me having the, the confidence to play them. One thing that struck me, if you don't mind me saying, when, when we went down, the national team went down, when Walter got the, the job and we had a, you, you came and had a, a game of golf and we stayed uh, and we didn't have a Welcome. game, we just had a, a, a meet up and we came and trained at Carrington and the one thing that struck me was it was not just a, a team that you were talking about of your players and your immediate staff, it was everybody in the building, it was the, yeah. the guy that let us in at the door, it was the, the lady that cleaned the dressing rooms and everybody that we spoke to as we were just dotting about, etc. You know, you, you say as you do, what's he like to work for, etc. They all very much felt part of that team. And I'm assuming that was your, your ethos, was that everybody in the club or everybody in the, the country, if it was a national team, had to be behind that group. Absolutely. My first job at the United was to get to know everyone in the whole club, every other first names. I think that if I was asked this question at Harvard last year, what would I like to have known 
30 years ago and I knew now and it's communication. But I had a bit of that anyway. And no understanding the, the, the value of people working for you. Club United, mm -hmm. never to be forgotten. You know, it's easy to forget people who work so hard and their wages are poof, much less than yep. these players are getting. And we, 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 the United have got that great family spirit. And I think Samad had a lot to do with that also. But it's really important to recognise people who are working for you. Not just always the coaches and the, the team itself, but to recognise the people who are doing the laundry, the groundsmen. And the, grounds, the ground staff, I terrorised them. Yeah. And they loved it. Yeah. <laughs> because I recognised them, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I recognised them. Tony, the old groundsman, he, the, the job he's done at Old Travel, they won the pitch of the year last year. Won the pitch of the year, and Tony got the groundsman of the year. And that's because he works his socks off. Yep. You know, so I was going out to Old Trafford on Sunday. As Tony, it's the worst pitch in Britain. And I drove away. It's <laughs> <laughs> killing himself laughing. I hope you noticed that. We're asking Harvard-style questions here. Yeah, uh, yeah. In that, you, you've mentioned about leadership, and we've spoken about leadership today. And it's quite nice, this. <laughs> it's a cosy wee living room. Uh, <laughs> It's a, it's a fiercely competitive business professional sport and, and football reflects that, I think. And you've always struck, I think, as, as a person who's been happy to share your knowledge and you hear of a lot of managers, not just the, the Steve Bruce's or the people, Brian Robson's, that have played for you over the years, but other managers that, that you've spent a bit of time with. And I'm guessing you've felt that's been important for you and to give a wee bit back. What, what's your kind of thoughts behind well, that? Well, I think it's about the... the the prestige of Manchester United, really. I think you should share your knowledge because I think at the end of the day, giving knowledge is not a, not a, a threat to me because it's how I impart my knowledge may be different for everyone else. But having the knowledge and how you deal with it is two different things, you know, and mm -hmm. we were happy to share and give people information. Bayern Munich are fantastic at it. Uh, the, we modelled a lot of the stuff from Bayern Munich. They were so open about it. So they, like me, shared... Because you're big enough to be able to handle threats and, and, yep. and competition. There's no problem for us. But um, I never looked upon it as, as an encumbrance in my job. I thought it was important to, to share, your, because you're getting united and yeah. the prestige of your club have got, to share with other people is never a problem. But your job, I mean, I know from speaking to some of the coaches, even in the building and around Scotland, that are doing the pro licence, and you've been very generous in your, in your time around. To run a club like Manchester United is a, is a massive job because, again, it's not just the football side you're dealing with, albeit you've got a chief executive and an admin side, but my guess is you were pretty much the, the linchpin of everything that ran in the place, even yeah. out with the football yeah, side. I think, I, think, um, I think particularly in the first 15 years, I think everything dovetailed around me. I, I was involved in everything. But then when you got older, and it's really important for people will get older to understand this. And there's been a few here, maybe. <laughs> but um, when I got to, um, when I got to about 60, I then realized I would need to delegate. Because having the energy to do everything I was doing in those previous years, you know, you, you, it'd be difficult to do it. And then I had to understand how I can keep my energy in terms of the food I ate, time I went to bed, at, Nights out, I mean, when I was younger, you could do the nights out, but at six in the morning, you know, we all could do that. But when you go older, what, the reason that, that is, I'm saying that is because when I came to United at 44 years of age, and right up to that period when I changed, people could see the energy. But they expect to see it all the time. Yeah. Particularly your football players, your players. So I want to keep that energy, and the best way I could do is to make sure I, 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 I controlled how I lived the hours I slept, the food I ate, okay, the red wine comes different. That's a different yeah. compartment. That's over there. <laughs> but you know that it really is important to remember that because when you get older, the energy is still going to show that energy and you've, you're up for it. Yep. And I always wanted to make sure I went into that ground every morning with purpose, that everyone saw that purpose, you know. And you were traditionally one of the first, if not the first in, in the ground every morning, were you not? Well, yeah, I would come in. Well, it was, good. it was interesting because when I used to come in really early in the morning at, at the cliff, I was always first time with the groundsman and the caretaker. And uh, the people would start coming in around about 9 o'clock. But at Carrington, funny enough, 
when the, 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 the staff ta started to increase because the size of Carrington, but then five physios, six sports science and all that type of thing, all the physios and the medical staff started to come in the same time as me. So it was great. I'm not saying I was an example, but it was great because we could discuss all the medical issues at breakfast in the morning because yeah. there was yeah. only medical staff and the physios that were there. Yeah. And the ground staff were in a different bit of the, the, the canteen, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that was brilliant for me because then the, that's out the road. And you knew who was available to you, who was training, who might be yeah. available for the game. Any issues yeah. discussed. It's interesting, you know, that those of us that know Stuart will, will see huge amount of parallels, uh, not least been in first every morning. Uh, memory, memories of Stuart, but I finally managed to get him to phone me at quarter past seven instead of seven every morning. Because quarter past seven, I was usually in the park walking the dog. Seven o'clock, I was usually still in the shower, but it took a bit of time before he did it. He was the only person to ever get into the hospital through A&E because the doors of the hospital were never open in the morning so come <laughs> through casualty. Yeah. So a lot of the things in parallels. And, and Stuart, too, was somebody that, that, that worked really hard in different areas of, of life and his sports medicine, cardiology. And as he got older, realised the importance of, of delegating and having people around that he could, he could trust. And, and, and you, you've done the, you've done the yeah. same. Perhaps one last question, and then maybe we've a couple of minutes, we might just open it up to the audience. And it's really a, as a way of introduction to Luis, who's going to speak next from Madrid. Uh, you've, you've had, a, you've had a, a game against them all, all these years ago, and, and he's going to give us a, a bit of an insight into to football in, in Spain. And I know you watch a lot of, of football to now, Champions League finals coming up. We were mm. maybe hoping it was going to yeah. be Barca and, and Real Madrid. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so am I. <laughs> and over the years, I, I presume you've, you've watched a lot of Spanish football and, and enjoyed a lot of Spanish football. Do you think, what would be the differences between their approach to playing football and perhaps ours in the UK, just as a, a lead into Lewis? Well, first of all, you have to consider what Real Madrid to change the world of football in the, in the, when they win the five trophies in a row, five European Cups. They were the first club to bring players from other countries, right? Yeah. And the most important was Di Stefano. Yeah. From, he was Argentinian, he played in Colombia, come back to Argentina, went to Real Madrid. Then they get Puskas, they get Copa, they get um, De, De Maria, uh, De, Del Sol. Um, so it was an international team, the first to recognise if you're going to be the best, you have to bring quality. So they were the first to do it. Then Barcelona players at Cossets, um, Kubala, uh, players like that, and then the later years of uh, Cruyff, Maradona, Ronaldo, the older Ronaldo. Yeah. Uh, so they've always been able to do that, whereas English clubs never ventured that kind of culture. It was always producing the Stanley Matthews or the homebred players or the Tom Finneys, Dennis Laws, Ken Douglas. They never really ventured, and there's never been, if you think about it, we've never had the player, apart from Cristiano Ronaldo, could equal the Messi's and the, the Croix's and the mm -hmm. Puskas's, really. But great, some great players have come to the country, but not that stellar, world-class type player. And you have to wonder why. Is it money? Don't think so, because no, the Premier no. Division are paying the best money now. Yep. It must be to do with the, well, the history of the clubs, of course, Barcelona and Real Madrid, but also the climate. I think the climate does encourage, if you have the choice, <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> fact, today's at, fact, today's at East Stirling. I think that, that does reflect on all of us, because I think we're much more open now. Uh, you know, Niall mentioned the Institute looking at, at ex what other groups are doing and looking at innovation coming from, from elsewhere. So I think moving forward.